Okay, hey guys, we are back again. And our next speaker is David Farkas. He's an associate director of experience design in EPAM Leaf. Sorry, <laughs> in EPAM. And by the way, he is uh, one of the co authors of the O'Reilly book, UX Field Research Basics. I believe this speech will be amazing. So let's start. David, please. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, my audio is coming through okay, you will you? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited uh, to be here today. I'm going to be talking about UX field research basics. Um, just rounding out the background a little bit, the book is actually UX research. I co-authored that back in 2016, and I also have a second book, Collaborative Improv, that is uh, just past the one-year mark. It just celebrated its one-year birthday. It's on applying improv techniques to what we do as uh, UX consultants, as practitioners. Uh, but I've been doing research for um, well over a decade, uh, studied at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, uh, been with EPAM well over six years. And that's really gonna be the focus of what we talk about today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about qualitative field research today, the process and tools that goes into that, and really understanding what goes into research. Uh, we only have an hour today, so we're not going to be talking about quantitative research. We're not going to be talking about choosing methods, uh, and we're not going to be talking about how to be a researcher. Um, the spoiler for that is if you are attending um, this session today or any of the sessions today, you're already taking you know, a step towards being a researcher. Anyone can be a researcher. Anyone can ask good questions. Uh, there's nothing special about what I do other than um, I've been given the label and title of researcher. But I really like to encourage anyone and everyone to do research at any stage of a pro project. So how I'd like to break up our time today is spend the bulk of our time talking about planning and preparation. We'll probably spend about three quarters of the time there. Spend a little bit of time talking about what happens when we are out in the field or given the nature of everything with COVID and being remote work when we were out conducting research from the comfort of our home offices or wherever that might be. And then uh, conclude very briefly on how we find the patterns and synthesize our research into storytelling. So let's start with planning and preparation and let's start with uh, just qualifying why we want to plan our research. Uh, planning really helps validate initial assumptions about existing research. I have this uh, belief that anything that is older than six months, whether it's previous research, uh, previous conversations, previous decisions, if something is more than six months old, it no longer is a requirement and it become, becomes a hypothesis. So planning helps us uh, validate or identify what those hypotheses are. Planning also helps us ensure that we cover all the necessary topics in our research. We have very limited amount of time to speak with our participants, sometimes as short as 20 or 30 minutes, sometimes as long as 90 minutes, but that's still a very small window of time to learn a lot about these people's uh, worldviews and how they use systems. Planning helps sessions flow smoothly. We never go into a conversation unstructured. We wanna make sure we know what we wanna cover. And uh, planning also helps reduce design debt, which helps reduces technical debt. So we all know about technical debt and needing to go back you know, months or years later and clean up our code base because we were doing things quickly. Design debt is you know, uh, the design systems that Farid was talking about, helping reduce that by having scalable systems, systems that can evolve over time, make changes easily. Research helps inform both of those things by making sure that we are designing and building the right thing um, sooner, earlier, and more often. So there are a number of work products that go into the planning. Uh, there's no way I can cover all of the work products given the uh, time we have today, uh, but I wanna cover some of the most common or some of the more important that uh, might be overlooked. There's sort of gonna be a span there. And I'll talk about what each of those are um, as we hit on them. The first one, and this should exist for any research phase, if it's a one week research program or a you know one year research program, is the test plan. This is a one page document that really provides the project background, the research background, the purpose, the methodologies, and the outcomes. There's a really nice template that I've uh, adapted from usability.gov, that website's on the bottom there. Um, there's a number of great resources there that are publicly available. Uh, and this is a one page document that says, you know, we're gonna be conducting contextual inquiries with, across these three user groups. It's gonna take two weeks with the expectation to better understand how we do something. And the idea of it is, um, you know, 
being able to give a quick high level summary. I am extremely uh, strict about it being one page only. And that's because I want this to be something that can be printed out, handed to someone in the hallway or in an elevator. And there's no concern about staples or you know tape or paper clips and paper pages getting lost. So one page, an executive can have this, scan it and understand the value of what we're doing and why. So the most important thing I think it exists with every research pro, um, program, every research approach is a test plan. It takes about you know 10 or 20 minutes to jot down, but it helps qualify and centralize everyone as to what we're doing. The second most important document is the recruitment screener. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are speaking with the right folks as we go through our research. Uh, we don't just wanna take anyone off the street or anyone who has awareness of our system. Uh, I do a lot of work in financial services and life sciences. We don't want anyone with a bank account for financial services. We might want people with a certain variety of bank accounts, balancing, checking, and savings and investments, depending on the specificity of our uh, research, the specificity of what we're trying to design. Recruitment screeners are guided surveys. They break down the demographics and the behaviors, and it also starts to look at the scheduling constraints. So um, again, we don't have you know six months or eight months very often to do research. We have maybe two or three weeks. So one thing we need to qualify is you might be a great participant that we want to speak with, but based on your schedule, you're not available until August. But you know we need to do this research in July, so unfortunately, we won't be able to schedule you uh, at this time. We can always you know, keep your name and number in the backlog, uh, can't reach out to you for another research, but scheduling, demographics, behaviors are all things that go into uh, capturing the right folks to uh, recruit, uh, and we do that through a screener. And then the interview guide. Uh, this is another really important uh, aspect of um, planning and preparation. This could be as short as a three-page document for something that's um, more service design oriented, where it's more open-ended, and we're just trying to understand the broad range of spaces. It might be very uh, lengthy and detailed in the case of something like concept validation or task analysis, but they all have the same general sections. There's the opening script, and I can sort of do this uh, introduction um, blindfolded at this point, but it's my name is David, I'm a researcher with EPAM. Uh, we're here to evaluate the system. We're not here to test you. There's no wrong answer. We would like your candid feedback, really setting them at ease about what you're doing and why you're there. The contextual section, so whether it's you know understanding background information, tools they use, uh, goals or tasks or anything like that, we really start to vary and change a lot depending on the specificity of the research uh, itself. Again, if it's concept validation, task analysis, more service design oriented, or anything else. The idea of the interview guide, though, is we want to challenge our assumptions. We want to make sure we're asking good questions, and we'll talk about good questions in a moment, uh, but really leading into that um, uh, so that we are coming up with new novel insights and not simply validating or confirming uh, our, our own uh, internal biases. One piece of planning and preparation that isn't often used, but I think it's very important to talk about, especially for folks newer to research, is the introduction packet. This is really important, um, especially if you are visiting people on site in their homes, in their offices, but can also be a value uh, for remote research as we've all adapted to quite a bit over the last um, three to five months. Uh, the introduction packet's an opportunity to pre-introduce yourself. It could be your background, a photo, key contact information, uh, for remote sessions, you know, contact information and background is definitely important. You'll be meeting with David Farkas. He's a researcher with EPAM, and uh, he'll see you on the Zoom call at this time. You've been doing a lot of research through Zoom. But in person, adding that photo, adding that personal touch of David's going to be joining you with Michelle and Ashish. Um, those are two folks I've been doing some research with lately. Uh, having photos of the three of us would be really important if we're showing up to your house, because especially, you know, um, privacy, security, all those things, knowing who's coming up to your house, it's one less barrier of entry. Being able to see, you know, yes, this person matches the photo, uh, it's, a, it's a big comfort there. Um, I just gave something away through a neighborhood uh, Facebook page and I was able to see, verify that the person coming to the door matched the photo of the person's profile. And it's just that level of comfort of knowing that this is the person I've been communicating with, it's not a stranger, and it makes it much easier to build rapport and build relationships there. Another piece of travel, and this feels a little uh, dated all of a sudden, is travel logistics. Um, I think it's still really important to include, uh, given the 
the situation, given the time, I know uh, not a lot of us are traveling uh, for work right now, but mapping out routes, um, you know, getting uh, on the road between offices. So usually uh, I had a clever picture here about how long it took to go from my house or my EPAM office to, uh, you know, wherever the research is happening. Um, all of the research has been happening in, in my home right now and dialing it through uh, online. But it's still really important to make sure we you know, plan for the timing. We know how long it's going to take. Some technologies take longer to connect than others. Uh, making sure we plan time for the participants to onboard onto Zoom or Teams or whatever it is. Uh, I do, uh, as I'm sure many folks do uh, in today's sessions, you know, dozens of Zoom and Skype and Teams calls a day, but our participants might be doing one or two a week where this might be their first time. So planning that extra time for setup and preparation is really important. Planning breaks and meals just because we're working from home doesn't mean we don't need to take a break, we don't need to eat. Uh, I try to schedule no more than um, three sessions a day. Four is really the, the healthy limit, but I try to cap it at three. I try to put at least 30 minutes between each session that allows, um, you know, avoiding overscheduling in case we need to, uh, you know, um, run over on one, reset any technology, bathroom, coffee breaks, any of those sort of things are all really important there. And then another piece of planning and logistics that I think are really important are the team instructions. Uh, usually I share these verbally only, only in one instance in my entire career have I had to actually print these out. Uh, and what you see on the right hand side is uh, the one instance where I had to print it out. Uh, but really these are instructions for, uh, it's gonna be a conversation, the research is a conversation between you know me as the moderator, the note taker and the participants. Sometimes I'm also the note taker, uh, but really the three of us, we always like to invite clients and stakeholders and additional team members to observe the research. Uh, but we try to ask them to avoid asking questions during the sessions. Uh, we don't want to you know, find a rabbit hole or um, deviate from the discussion guide too far. Uh, we don't want to lead the client or lead the participant um, down something, uh, down the wrong path or lead them into giving us an answer that they might ex uh, think we're expecting. We want them to give natural, honest answers. Uh, I do make sure that everyone knows there will have an opportunity to ask questions. So either at the end of key sessions, sections of the research, I pause and I ask my colleagues if they have anything they want to add. At the end of the research, I always ask my colleagues first if they have any questions, and then I ask the participant if they have any questions. So I give everyone an opportunity to um, uh, put in their feedback if there's something additional to provide there. Controlling nonverbal reactions, super important. Uh, body language, especially with video, you sort of only see this much of me here. Um, but, you know, facial expression, shoulders, if I seem distracted, if I'm looking off at my notes, you know, on my second monitor, I might look distracted. So looking into the camera, look, making eye contact, being present, staying focused is really important there. So that's a lot of the planning and the documentation that goes into creating the research. Once we're doing the research, another thing that's super important is the notes worksheet. Uh, this is using Microsoft OneNote and having every participant dated. Um, you know, this was a project we were doing based off of, um, it was easy, we had participants on the East Coast of the United States, the West Coast, uh, some folks that were a little bit more global. Um, so we were capturing that way. Uh, but I would also, I've been using uh, my, uh, just Word and uh, writing directly in the discussion guide and saving as a copy for each session. Um, it's super important to have these digital. It's super important to have these centrally located on SharePoint or Dropbox or OneDrive, whatever you're using. Uh, the idea is you want to make sure that if you have multiple research teams, multiple note takers, everyone is able to take notes in a consistent, streamlined manner. And everyone knows where those notes are. Um, realizing some people are, you know, much quicker at taking notes, uh, handwriting, um, definitely take your notes handwritten if that's how you're uh, more comfortable. I'm not trying to say everyone needs to go into the digital realm. But one thing I would uh, strongly urge is if you are, um, you know, if you do prefer handwriting, as soon as that session is done as closely to the end of that session as possible, type up your notes into OneDrive, into Microsoft Word, uh, wherever you might do it. Um, our handwriting is, you know, if your handwriting is anything like mine, it's, you know, difficult to read uh, a day or two after writing it down. Uh, we might use shorthand or anything like that. And paper gets lost, but it's much harder to lose digital um, artifacts that sort of go to the cloud and populate across many machines. So it's really important to digitize that, make sure it's available to our team, uh, and doing that through the notes worksheet. 
So that's a lot of the uh, tools of the trade that go into planning. Um, once we have that, I mentioned asking good questions and sort of defining questions. Uh, that's a really hard aspect of what we do as researchers. And I want to spend some time talking about how we can actually craft good questions, what these mean. And to do that, let's start by defining what a good question is. A good question seeks to explore the unknown in a targeted and guided way while putting the participant at ease to open up and provide feedback you might not have expected or anticipated. Now, this is a very fine uh, line we have to balance. We're asking very targeted and guided questions. Again, we have as little as 20 minutes, as many as 80 or 90 minutes. So we need to be very targeted and guided in what we're asking. But at the same time, we're looking for the unexpected and the unanticipated. So it's, uh, you know, takes, takes a little bit of cleverness in how we word our questions, how we listen to our answers to really understand this. To give this example a little bit more uh, substance, uh, we're gonna use um, uh, the example of talking to hobby photographers and look at the structure of a good question. There are four main aspects to any question. The first is the setup. The setup provides the frame of reference for what we're talking about and where this takes place. So when you are on a photo walk, when you were in the studio, when you were on vacation, you know, giving us a time frame and a point of reference there. And then we move into our area of uh, inquiry. How do you decide what scenes you want to take a photograph of? Again, if I was uh, on a photo walk or on vacation or in a studio, I would be just making those decisions very differently. So provide some structure, provide some framework based off of the type of research we're looking to do. Now we get that question, you know, when you're on a photo walk, how do you decide what you're taking a photograph of? Um, someone might say, I really like to take uh, photos of vintage cars I see parked on the, uh, on the street. That's great. Now we want a ladder. We want to elevate that question to the next piece of information. How do you determine if a scene has been captured the way you want it? How do you measure, quantify the lighting? How do you capture the composition? How do you do these things? Uh, anyone who has young children or nieces and nephews uh, knows that little kids like to ask why a lot or how. Um, this is really capturing that, you know, uh, toddler mindset of asking why or how or, you know, um, explain it to me um, more and more and more. There does come a point, though, where we've exhausted that line of questioning. We don't want to uh, exhaust ourselves or our participants. Uh, so then we segue to the next question. We make it a natural conversation. Do you do all these things out in the field or do you, um, you know, qualify some of, some of the photos back at the computer and you just take a lot. You know, you, you can sort of give, give two answers and have them choose one, or you can um, just say, how long does this typically take you? And then we've moved into the, into the next line of questioning. This is a really simple uh, structure of a question, but there's a lot of things to keep in mind here. There's a lot of trademarks of a question we want to keep in mind. Uh, thinking about good questions being open-ended, uh, so what do you take photos of is very open-ended as opposed to a leading question, which is, do you take photos of vintage cars when you're on a photo walk? Leading questions have the answer in the question already. Leading questions can typically be answered uh, with yes or no answers or, you know, two or three words at most. Uh, we really want to keep something much more open-ended. We also, with good questions, want to balance specificity. That's where we have that um, uh, lead into the question. So when you're on a photo walk, when you're in your studio, is balancing specificity because it's providing some structure, some framework of where to focus instead of just saying, what do you take photos of? And then, you know, most photographers take photos of a lot of different type of subject matter in a lot of different type of contexts. That's really a little too vague and too ambiguous there. Again, that compare that to a bad question, which is shallow. Do you go on photo walks? Yes, no. Um, again, shallow questions, leading questions, all can be answered with you know, three words or fewer. Good questions also flow naturally. This is where we have the segue. This is where we have the laddering. Uh, we want these to be conversations. Uh, the trademark of a good researcher is they make things feel, they make the participant feel like you know, their friend for many years. Uh, it's a natural conversation. It's a dialogue, a lot more listening than speaking. Um, and compare that to an interview where, you know, I ask and you answer or um, heavens forbid, a uh, interrogation where, you know, you feel obligated to answer. We want research to be natural. We want research to flow. And that's a really good trademark of a good question and a good researcher. And then lastly, uh, just looking at a bad question, bad questions will uncover personal or unconscious bias. 
Uh, if I said, you know, I hate floral pictures, uh, what do you take photos of? And if you're a, you know, uh, uh, take photos of a lot of plants and, and trees and things like that, you suddenly might feel very uh, insecure telling me that that's what your favorite thing to do is. So making sure that we avoid our own personal uh, biases, our unconscious biases, and ask the questions in as open-ended a way as possible is key there. So we've talked about the uh, work products to sort of go into planning for research. We've talked into about the questions and how we craft good questions. And now we need people to actually uh, facilitate research with. Without people, we don't really have um, uh, research. We just have uh, really a lot of planning uh, going into things. There are two main uh, methods for recruiting participants. Uh, one is self-recruiting. I will say self-recruiting is uh, something to be avoided um, as much as you can. It is you know, through cold calls, me picking up the phone or live recruiting, uh, like this gentleman with the clipboard here, uh, you know, at a street fair or anything like that, trying to intercept people, sending out emails, sending out surveys. Uh, the one bit of self-recruiting I find valuable, and we do this a lot uh, within the organization, is friends and family sending out an email saying, does anyone have a solar energy in your friends group? Please send them to us. We're working with a new energy provider. We would love to speak with them. That one tends to work, um, but the other three or five here um, tend to be much, much more cumbersome. Instead, what I really encourage everyone does is outsource your recruiting. It um, greatly reduces the amount of time to prepare for research, to schedule and plan for research. We can use market research firms, uh, things like userinterviews.com, online user groups, you know, whether it's Facebook groups or subreddits or anything like that, find where your participants are, meet them in their turf and uh, recruit them. Just, you know, make a post, hi, I'm a researcher looking to understand solar power. Please reach out to us. My favorite method of recruiting though is client recruiting. Uh, our clients have whole databases of who their customers are, who their customers were, and who they want their customers to be. So partnering with their marketing team, we can have a lot of really good conversations finding who we want to talk to, who the power users are, who the infrequent users are, reach out to them and schedule through the marketing team. Uh, that is one, one way I've definitely found some of the best benefits and best use of recruiting. And then some other online testing tools, uh, user testing, dscout. dscout's a great one if you're interested in doing diary studies. Uh, there are a number of other tools out there, but those are a few to, to be in mind of. So we have our test plan and our approach, we have our questions, and now we have our people. How do we actually manage our day and go through the process of research in a, a cool, collected, and measured way? Um, I know I mentioned it earlier, and again, it feels a little, um, you know, out of date given the current situation, but travel time to the office or cities, even if we are working from home, making sure we have time to wake up, make ourselves presentable, um, you know, even if it's from the waist up, you know, a button down shirt and still, you know, shorts on the bottom because we're getting to the summer months, um, whatever it is, uh, building access, maybe that's more technology access, making sure again that we have all of the plugins installed for Zoom or Teams or whatever we're using. Uh, dress code, making sure, you know, um, wearing a branded shirt today for the company, but making sure we are dressing up or dressing down appropriately. Uh, this photo is a project I was a part of about four years ago where we were conducting literal field research at farms, uh, understanding how uh, livestock were um, handled and lived so that we could um, uh, better support them with uh, some technology supports. The usual, you know, um, uh, slacks and button down and dress shoes would not have been appropriate here. In fact, we were told we needed uh, rubber boots up to our knees um, so that we could walk through the manure and walk through the farm and everything. So it was really important to uh, have that conversation about the dress code there. And then making sure we have a dedicated workspace also. So, um, you know, when offices open up again and we have uh, the opportunity to visit people in their environment, in their offices, in their homes, we want to make sure that we aren't finishing a research session, walking around the hall and talking about the participant either, you know, at the water fountain 10 feet away from their desk, at the bottom of their driveway in our cars. We want to have a dedicated office. We want to find the gas stations or the coffee shops near, nearby where we can go as a team and reconvene over there. Um, anyone who's ever gone camping knows um, sort of the, the mantra of carry in, carry out and leave no trace. It's very uh, much the same with uh, research where 
when we're done the research, we want to leave the environment as untouched as we can and leave our participants feeling as unburdened by us as possible. Uh, and lastly, technology is not your friends. Um, this is only exacerbated with everyone working remote. So again, our participants might not be familiar with the technology tools. Uh, I've been giving you know, dozens of presentations and workshops uh, using PowerPoint over the last three months with Zoom. Um, I didn't realize it until just before today, but I was using Keynote for this presentation and I had a moment of panic of will uh, Zoom and the, the two screens work the same way? And uh, I'm relieved to see that they do work, um, but I, I had a moment of panic there. And um, the way we can avoid some of that is tech checks, um, testing technology before each session. Um, speaking of Keynote, I didn't think of that until this morning, but uh, had I, I would have tested that um, uh, yesterday or earlier in this week. Uh, having checklists before each, uh, at the beginning of each day, at the end of each day, at the beginning and end of each session, making sure our research materials are organized, are prepared, that our prototype or our tools have been properly reset. If we needed to debug anything or figure anything out, um, you know, that we have an opportunity to do that and making that through checklists. Part of the checklists is also how we manage our documents. There are a number of different documents uh, that we have. Um, this is, uh, pictured here is a three ring binder. It's about uh, two inches thick. Um, and I carry it with me whenever I do um, field research in offices or I had it with me uh, in that farm photo. There are a number of pocket dividers. Each divider has a pocket in the front and back. Uh, the front has blank copies of all of these items listed on the left and the back is the completed copies. Things like consent forms. Yes, I consent to you interviewing me and using my information. Uh, honorarium information if we are compensating the participants in any way. Those discussion guides when I do field research, you know, in the in the wild, in person, I'm a pen and paper type of person, especially if I'm the moderator. My notes are sort of all scribbles about where I want to take the conversation. Um, and the notes forms, if I'm if I'm the note taker, you know, again, I'll be more likely handwriting. Uh, personally, I find handwriting a little bit less intrusive than uh, having a barrier of a laptop in front of me. Um, if you do choose to take uh, notes on your laptop, um, just one side note on that is I highly recommend you um, try to find a consistent cadence of typing. So if the participant says something and you start typing very furiously and then you stop because you took that note and you're waiting for the next interesting thing, a participant starts to pick up on that and they start to you know want to get that gratification of seeing you type um, because then they know they are giving you good information or valuable information or where they have that perception. Being able to find a, you know, consistent speed of typing, even if you just need to type, you know, I'm waiting for the next thing, I'm waiting for the next thing so that it looks like you're typing, uh, gives the illusion that everything is valuable and participants feel uh, much calmer about providing feedback there. Recordings, photo images, storage, obviously um, doesn't exist inside this folder here, but again, SharePoint, OneDrive, Dropbox, whatever we're using, making sure that after those sessions that we are exporting the saved files, labeling them appropriately, uh, storing them in a place where the whole team can gather them uh, is really important throughout what we're doing. Um, and also as we are preparing to go out in the field, we wanna make sure we practice um, a lot. So, you know, perfect practice prevents piss poor performance. Um, this is an expression I uh, learned from a colleague um, at my first job um, when I was in financial services. But there's a lot of truth to this. We want to practice the discussion guide. We want to practice going through the prototype. And we want to find our own voice. Um, I've written countless uh, discussion guides for all types of research, contextual inquiries, task validation, serves design. I know how I deliver something. I can write a discussion guide that sounds like my tone and my personality. The problem with that is if I give my discussion guide to a colleague, they're gonna sound a little more stilted if they're trying to read it word for word. Um, so what I like to do is, especially for newer researchers, is give them my discussion guide and I encourage them to rewrite the guide. Keep the questions structure, make sure that we're not leading and not exposing bias, but I will write in some of the verbal tics I have. I will write in some of the pauses and expressions I know I use. Um, I encourage people to rewrite discussion guides to follow their own voice. Um, it's really important to feel natural. It's really important to have that conversation. And it's really important, I think, also for everyone to be able to contribute to what we're doing uh, in a natural way. 
uh, and even unmoderated sessions get rehearsed. So uh, we're talking a lot today about um, qualitative research and you know in-person or remote moderated research. But there's a lot of sessions we can do where it's just task analysis through user testing or um, uh, any of user Zoom, any of those. Even those unmoderated sessions we want to have rehearsed. We want to grab someone from the office, ask them to go through this task, evaluate the time it takes, evaluate the instructions, make sure everything is clear. Um, I would say unmoderated sessions where, you know, me as a research facilitator is not there. Those actually require more preparation and more practice because if I'm having a conversation with you in real time and there's a struggle, I can give you a little bit more explanation. I can, you know, leave the prototype and go somewhere else as needed. But in an unmoderated session, uh, the safety net of another person there to support and troubleshoot is not available. So we really need to be careful about uh, what that looks like and how we approach that. So we have our documents, we have our questions, we have our people, and we have our schedule we feel prepared. Um, I said uh, at the top, I'm gonna spend a lot of the time in section one about the preparation. Uh, let's move into actually facilitating research a little bit. When facilitating research, uh, we really want to start with our introductions and our warm ups. These are that, you know, hi, my name is the setting the friendly tone. You know, I mentioned it earlier in the discussion guide, but it's the my name is David. We're here to work on a better financial system, a better, um, you know, energy system, a better healthcare service, whatever it is. Uh, we want to improve the system for you, make it better, humanizing ourselves. Um, this is the idea of small talk. Uh, when I meet people in their offices, in their homes, I will look around and try to find something to anchor, you know, and build a relationship off of. Whether it's seeing uh, baseball or sports memorabilia or, you know, um, photos of families and activities they do, I'll try to just ask them about that. You know, oh, I see that's a, you know, I see you go fishing. Like, you know, when's the last time you went? Uh, you know, what do you typically go for? I don't know anything about fishing, uh, but it just starts to build a relationship and build interest. So it's that art of small talk. Um, when we're remote, you know, when we have things going on uh, in the world like we are today, just checking in, you know, hey, how are you feeling with quarantine? How are you feeling with everything going on in the world? We're not looking to, you know, detract from the conversation, uh, the focus of the discussion guide, but realizing that everyone's human uh, and just appreciating that and giving, you know, maybe two or three minutes, especially um, today where there are a number of things going on in the world that can uh, detract us personally and emotionally. Uh, being sensitive to the fact that, you know, someone is giving us their time, uh, but they're still humans and there's still a lot going on in the world to distract us. So honoring that and respecting that is really important. When we are facilitating our research, we want to manage our flow. So uh, anyone who's a video gamer knows that you don't start on the hardest level. You don't start on the big boss. You start easy and you build to complexity. A uh, big part of that is knowing when to back off, knowing where a participant might be starting to give us, you know, very short, terse answers because they don't want to answer something, and knowing when to push, push further, uh, recognizing where they are giving us partial answers. And if we ask them about, you know, one of the modifiers they're using or one of the verbs they're using, they might give us a little bit more insight, a little bit more information. Now, there is a very fine line here. There have been times where I've, uh, you know, asked a, asked a uh, participant about something and they said, oh, well, you know, I really like what, you know, what the client does. I really like what the product service does, but I'm worried because, you know, a lot of things go to the competitor. And I would ask, you know, tell me what type of thing goes to the competitor? And they go, well, you know, a lot of things go to the competitor. Right. What type of things go to the competitor? And now this is the third time I'm asking the same follow-up question. I get the same answer. There's just a lot of things the competitor does that are different. That's a point where I want to back off. Clearly, there's something, whether it's, you know, financial or relationship-based, where they don't want to expose this piece of information about the competitor. But instead, if they said, you know, yeah, it's other things like the competitor does, tell me, like what? Well, the competitor offers better integration with, you know, with third-party software. Oh, which third-party software do they integrate with? Now, based off of that same line of questioning, we're getting a different feedback. I, I know that I can push further and explore and learn more there. It's a balancing act and uh, no one learns it uh, on the first day. There've actually been times where uh, I've needed to back off and I was trying to push and a colleague slipped me a sheet of paper saying, you know, you're losing him. And, um, you know, I saw that note and I registered and I very quickly segued to the next question. I reset, I realigned uh, and I managed the flow in that way. 
when we talk about managing flow, that's where we really want to think about improvisation in research. Uh, this is a photo from a uh, collaborative improv workshop I shared um, a few years ago. I've been working with uh, improv as a facilitation technique for a number of years. Uh, but what facil uh, excuse me, what improv allows us to do is think about how we can build off that feedback. There's this idea of yes anding in improv, you know, yielding to the strongest offer, taking something and building on it supporting our players, you know, my colleague, like I just shared, supporting me and giving me a little nudge in the right direction, supporting our participants, recognizing that the participant is the star, they are the ones in charge. Um, failure is okay. Not every research session is going to yield the best information, the richest content. Um, that's all right. It's always a learning experience uh, and to build off those experiences. A few key lessons are a few of the rules of improv. Uh, yes and everything is true I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, follow the funny is this idea in improv of follow the strange or unusual thing. Follow the thing that stands out or feels like an itch. Um, that's usually the business opportunity. That's usually the design opportunity, the differentiator. And mirroring, you know, our physicality uh, is super important. Um, repeating the last thing that the participants said makes them feel heard, makes them feel valued and things like that. Uh, I do, you know, half day workshops and full conversations on uh, collaborative improv. If you're interested in this, um, please check out the website collaborativeimprov.com. There's a link to the book there. Uh, and then I've been hosting uh, monthly improv jams. They are one hour, um, just sort of social gatherings to get an introduction to improv from a practice perspective. They are not focused around what we do for work. Um, the last one was two days ago on Thursday, but the next one is July 9th. Um, if you follow that bit.ly link, you can register for it. Um, it'd be great to see you there. Uh, it is at eight o'clock in the evening, Eastern time. Um, I realize for folks who might be uh, overseas, that might be uh, fairly late in the evening. So I do apologize for that. When talking about mirroring, um, another thing to note is uh, body language. Um, again, we can talk for probably a whole half day on body language and going through workshop exercises on that but there are verbal signs, the yes, the ahams, and sort of those verbal ticks. There's the nonverbal signs, so uh, nodding my head, leaning forward, leaning back. There's facial expressions. You know, if we think about excitement or the stinky egg face or anything like that, all of these things communicate different meaning to our participants, to our colleagues, to our stakeholders, to everyone we communicate with. Body language is a two-way street, so mirroring our participants, you know, how I see them, how they see me, um, how I'm perceived is super important. Uh, mirroring, um, very briefly, is uh, this idea that if your arms are crossed, if I cross my arms, uh, suddenly there's going to be a little more uh, mental, um, you know, connection there. Uh, closing our arms is closed body language. We want to be open body language because... Closed body language means, you know, I'm not receptive to new ideas. So I might start mirroring my participants' closed body language. Uh, and I realize the camera's cropping me um, so you don't fully see. Uh, but then slowly open my arms one at a time. My participant will then open their arms as well. And the idea behind that is that a open body um, also allows open, open thought, open reception. Um, it sounds a little pseudoscience-y, and I didn't believe it first um, years ago when I started using it, but there is a lot of truth to how our physical and how our mental states balance each other. Energy levels, uh, mental health, um, super important, treating every session as our first session, uh, swapping roles. I don't need to facilitate every session. Sometimes I like to note take, um, not only to give folks an opportunity to grow that skill, but gives me a break, um, uh, gives me an opportunity also to hear what's being said. It's very difficult as the moderator to capture and absorb the feedback. I'm very focused on the conversation in the moment. Um, changing the role allows me to work on a different part of my uh, brain and a different energy level there. Not overscheduling, taking breaks, uh, coffee is super important or tea, whatever it is for um, uh, whatever your poison is there. Handshakes, um, you know, we're in a we're in new territory here. So, you know, carry your, your hand sanitizer. We're probably not going to be handshaking our clients and stakeholders and participants as much as we used to um, six months ago. Being aware, again, of, you know, social constructs, health norms, um, you know, wearing masks, all those things uh, is greatly going to influence how we, how we research and how we design uh, and just being aware of those influences. And then as we are out on research, uh, there's debrief sessions. Uh, there are a number of different debrief sessions that are important. 
Uh, there are daily debrief sessions just with the team. Uh, maybe a client stakeholder is involved in this of, you know, what sessions we did, everything's successful, great. Team sessions and client sessions might be, you know, once or twice a week. And we can do these in person or remote. I've been part of research where we have two or three teams happening simultaneously across the country. Uh, we'll obviously do those remote. Other times where we're, you know, basing all of our research or we're all traveling together, we'll just have a quick half hour, um, you know, before going back to the hotel where we have a conversation. Does so everyone, everyone feel good? Is there anything we need to prepare for tomorrow or anything like that? So we've planned our research, we've gone out in the field, and now how do we uh, analyze and report on that information? Uh, again, we can spend a lot more time here uh, than we necessarily have available to us today, but I'll talk briefly about what we wanna do with this. The first is we want to consolidate our data. Uh, this means we want to define our data points, and I define a data point as any single thought, comment, or observation. If as you're typing your notes, there's a period, a semicolon, or a line break, that most likely is a new data point. And you want your data points to be as um, comprehensive as possible. So you don't want it just to be, you know, um, a bad homepage. Uh, you want it to be, you know, homepage, bad homepage because of clutter. You want it to have, be a complete thought so it can stand alone. You want to gather all the notes and transcripts. You want to identify those key data points. And there's a number of ways we can do that. Uh, this illustrated here is um, uh, I had a 15 foot by 15 foot room um, covered in post-it notes, all four walls from a trucking application I was working on. Uh, we can also use the rainbow spreadsheet. This is something uh, from Thomas Sharon. It's really nice for task analysis to be able to see success and failure of the tasks. Uh, it provides a nice um, output in a more quantitative way, which is nice. Again, affinity diagrams, this is probably one of the um, uh, simplest affinity diagrams I've ever created. Uh, it was actually from a workshop, not a research, hence the, the small size and small number of notes. Uh, but what I actually prefer to use a lot lately, and I've crafted a process for this, is Trello for synthesis. Uh, this allows us to color code um, our different notes. Green indicates the participant, and if we expand this, we would see different greens, some are participant one, some are participant two. Um, orange is quotes, blue is opportunities, red is breakdowns. And what's really nice about this is Trello is um, a cloud-based tool. We can work on it asynchronously. Uh, you know, whether we are a distributed team given the nature of COVID or a remote team as a lot of organizations are, uh, this is something everyone can work on in a very um, succinct way uh, without necessarily having to gather in a room. Another great benefit of Trello, um, I've been in situations where post-it notes have fallen off the wall um, overnight or during the weekend. Uh, Trello stays where, it, where it's supposed to be, so you don't have to worry about the air conditioning kicking on, suddenly half of your notes falling down, and you get back uh, on Monday after a long weekend, and suddenly you have no idea where these notes were, and you spend half the day trying to rebuild the synthesis. Um, Trello is sort of one of those super tools. Um, I've probably spent too long talking about it now. Um, but it's something I, I really encourage folks um, uh, to explore um, on that. After doing the synthesis, we want to find our stories. So the three main questions here is we want to define our audience. Is our audience, you know, business stakeholders? Is it technology stakeholders? Is it our own team? What do we want to achieve? Are we trying to convince them to build certain features first? Are we looking at a lighthouse vision? Or are we just trying to validate our hypotheses? And what should we use to communicate that goal? Um, very often we live in PowerPoint. PowerPoints take a lot of different forms, uh, photos, videos, quotes, um, all of these things are questions we want to explore. Uh, I love this illustration of um, the hero journey uh, from Donna. Um, it is uh, the uh, user's journey book. Um, highly recommend it. It's a great way to understand storytelling and a great introduction to that because we wanna look at the story we wanna tell. Again, the business strategy, the product roadmap, new opportunities, additional research. Sometimes we do you know, a, a quick two week round of research to say, what do we actually wanna understand better? Where do we actually have deeper questions? Um, identify additional knowledge gaps also. What do we not know? We know that uh, I just did a project in the real estate um, housing market. And we did two five week rounds of research. The first one was what do we think we know? And then the second round was, how do we think we, we design, how do we think we did based off of our designs? And now there's a third round of research to say, you know, okay, 
we did well in these two or three areas, we realized that these other two areas, we really don't know enough yet. Let's focus and double down our efforts there. Let's design what we know. Let's research what we don't know. And then, you know, over time, we will be able to improve that. Ultimately, research is iterative. So research should not happen at one point and then be done. There's never a time where we say we completed the research, we did the research, and now let's, you know, go into design development and never look at research again. Research can happen at any stage of the design development life cycle, at, the, at any stage of a product life cycle. And it definitely changes phase and format and style as we go through that, but research can be done anywhere. So what did we cover today? We talked a lot as I, as I sort of um, uh, prepared everyone for at the beginning about planning and preparing for research. We talked a little bit about being out in the field and we touched briefly on finding the patterns. Um, I wanna leave everyone with sort of uh, an adapted Chinese proverb here. The best time to do research was last sprint. The best, second best time to do research is today. It's never too late to do research. Uh, we can always do research um, today. We can always learn something to inform tomorrow. Um, you know, sometimes it might impact um, technical debt or design debt more or less, but it's never too late to do research. I wanna thank everyone. I know we have a few, uh, few minutes for questions. Before going into that, um, just a few resources that I really love um, other than UX research and collaborative improv um, for, for my own uh, publicities. Uh, Discussing Design is a great book on critique and communication. Uh, the Turnaround Podcast with Jesse Thorne is a podcast I really love. It came out about two or three years ago. Jesse interviews interviewers about interviewing. Uh, so Audie Cornish from NPR. Um, I honestly forget all of the other um, folks he interviewed. Uh, but it's really amazing to hear how these um, you know, radio and TV personalities who do a lot of interviews prepare for them, approach them, and go through that. Uh, how to Make Sense of Any Mess, if you're interested in, uh, in information architecture is great. Designing the conversation has a lot of tools and artifacts for um, uh, meeting preparation and workshop preparation. Uh, Brad Nunley is actually uh, the co-author of uh, UX Research with me as well, and a number of other books um, there to cover. Uh, so I want to thank you, and um, Julie, if we want to turn it over to questions. Yeah, sure. So thank you, David. So such... Uh, about this such thoughtful and inspiring presentation i really liked it and i think that it's a great detailed instruction for an action by the way and yes we do have a lot of question uh, questions uh, so let's start uh, the first question is from yuri zavodny uh, and he's asking um, the following Talking about researchers in general, how to integrate the research process into work with already existing products in and ongoing delivery, and how to make sure that researchers don't block the delivery, and if, if yes, how to convince everyone that it's necessary? Yeah. All right, um, there is a lot to unpack there. Um, I think the two, the two main questions I heard there is how to integrate research into ongoing delivery and how to convince folks that research is necessary. Yeah. Um, taking the first one of how to integrate research in ongoing delivery, uh, you know, we want to look at our sprint plan and there's this sprint, next sprint, and then sort of the backlog. Uh, what we don't want to do is try to tackle something on research that's happening this sprint or probably even next sprint. Um, much like design takes place, you know, one to two sprints ahead of development, we want the research to be one to two uh, sprints ahead of design. I know that takes a lot of planning and sort of seems, um, uh, might seem, especially with two-week sprints, we're talking, you know, three months ahead. Uh, but what we can do is take a question from the backlog and provide, um, ask what questions we want to validate on that. Usually something is in the backlog because we are still waiting on some technical requirements or business requirements there. So what we can do is we can use that gap in knowledge and that time that it's still in the backlog to uh, ask what hypotheses, what understandings do we currently have, and then be able to um, inform that through research. Uh, the second um, part of that question about how do we convince people to do research is, uh, I like to ask people the question of, you know, someone will come to me and say the requirement is X. We need to have, let's say something simple, like single sign-on. And this is in, you know, sprint four of, of the plan. What I would ask is, you know, what evidence do we have that single sign-on is necessary? And if the evidence is 
I want single sign-on because it seems cool, uh, then that's a hypothesis and that's a, a personal preference. And I know this is a very silly um, uh, example. Your single sign-on is, you know, there's a lot of validity from landscape analysis and just, you know, benchmarking to, to involve it. But what we can do is we can take this assumption and say, let's do some research on it. Let's, you know, gather five people. Let's do, let's do a heurist, heuristic analysis. Let's do a landscape analysis and look at the top five competitors and see if they have it. Um, the real estate application I mentioned I was working on, uh, you know, we did a landscape analysis and I don't believe anyone in that competitor field has single sign-on. So this didn't happen, but if a client said we want single sign-on, we could sort of, you know, say, let's, let's do some quick research. We're going to do a landscape analysis. We're going to do this. It'll take this long and, you know, we'll be ready by the time it gets to sprint four and let's explore if it's really valuable. So asking what the assumptions are, asking what the beliefs are, treating those as hypotheses, and then finding uh, the right size research approach is really important there. Okay, great. And let's talk about the relation to this user research. Uh, how do you handle it when people are skeptical to the value of user research? Um, so I think the main thing with uh, the skepticism towards research, uh, you know, what Fareed was talking about earlier about design systems and the efficiencies there and what has been, you know, that, uh, you know, the shift from waterfall to agile and lean. We know about technical debt. We know about, again, you know, the issues of building the wrong thing in the wrong way. And that conversation, I think, when adapted to research really, um, really hits some of the same notes. You know, we can design the system as you believe it should work, but wouldn't it be better to have a little bit more confidence on it and not to have that uh, technical debt, design debt caused, uh, caused upstream. Uh, so that's really where we treat a lot of the skepticism is we use some of the same vocabulary around uh, technical debt and design debt, and we adapt it to uh, what we're doing for research. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, the... Next question is from Anton Kazakol. How do you recommend recruiting people for B2B product research? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, yeah, sure. How do you recommend recruiting people for B2B product research? Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, um, for B2B products, there are two ways um, I would do this. One is um, we might just use within the organization. So there are a number of, whether it is a company intranets or company tools being uh, just used within the company, we will recruit employees of that service, uh, of that within that organization. For other systems where it's more, you know, B2B sales, cloud services, or anything like that, uh, that's again where we will use the marketing team to understand who are your two or three biggest clients here. Uh, I've done work with um, some of the large analytic firms, um, sort of research reporting firms, and they've given us, you know, folks that they work with uh, at that B2B level. Um, so using the, uh, our stakeholders and our client partners, um, they usually have a good idea of who they want to target. And what's really valuable about this also in the B2B space is, you know, a client might have a few hundred, um, you know, uh, uh, businesses that they serve as sort of their, you know, core group. But then there's those two or three clients that are the most, you know, the squeaky wheels or the most, you know, needy. And it's, it serves two purposes. We can use those as our research group. Uh, those squeaky wheels sort of then feel like they're being heard and have involvement. And it also gives us an idea of very specific um, uh, advisory board groups, so to speak, that we can learn from in a very um, uh, repeatable manner. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your answer. One more question from Yuri Zavodny. What is the risk of summarizing qualitative data that we get in from the searches and how to make sure that we will not bring there our own biases? Yeah, um, that is a great question. Uh, something I always talk about a lot uh, when I'm teaching folks how to do research is the risk of confirmation bias or observation bias. And the idea behind those is I want to bring my truth or my, my assumptions, make those tell a story that confirms those. Um, one thing I highly recommend if the team size, if the schedule allows is 
uh, not to conduct research on your own design, especially for folks newer to uh, the research process, is if I create a wireframe or a design and I'm also facilitating the research on that, is I might, even if the research in the discussion guide is very open-ended and not bleeding at all, my reaction when someone, you know, struggles or says they don't like something, my body language might, you know, influence that. Uh, so if the team size allows, especially for newer researchers, I would uh, highly okay. suggest um, exposing that. But also I would say that's where synthesis should not be just me synthesizing. We want the whole team to be involved. And that group think allows um, any biases to be surfaced, but also um, to, be, to be washed out, sort of. Okay. Thank you. A little bit smaller question, uh, but from another perspective. How to separate real facts and only respondent opinion uh, in the research sessions? Um, so I think the main thing here is to make sure that we are taking our notes as literally as possible. So we don't want to, when we take our notes, um, take notes that are uh, editorializing or commenting on what the participant is saying, we want the note to be as literal as possible. And by doing that, um, even if it is the participant's opinion, uh, that opinion is their truth. And then it's our job in synthesis to determine the importance of the hierarchy there. Okay, thank you. And the last question um, is from Bogdan Yemitz. As far as I know, not all people are predisposed to small talk how this can be understood and how to act in such situations? Yeah, uh, that is a great question. Uh, and small talk is definitely not something that everyone, everyone grows into naturally, but I think we all do small talk. So, you know, when we ride public transportation or get a coffee from, you know, the coffee shop, we have that, hi, how are you? How is your day? Thank you with the, the barista or the people in line. Um, uh, barbers, uh, pe you know, uh, people who cut hair and all that stuff, I think they are extremely good at small talk. And it just comes from practice. It's one of the reasons I do love uh, improvisation as a, as a skill, as a toolkit. I think, you know, there's things like Toastmasters and improv. Uh, all of those just teach ways to have conversations and feel a little bit more natural having conversations, even if we don't have uh, an existing relationship with someone. Uh, and it comes through practice more than anything. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, thank you, David. That was it for the questions. And again, thank you for such a great presentation. So, and you could say goodbye to your listeners. All right, thank you, everyone. It's been great.